very kind introduction. I'm going to try and make this as engaging as I can. I have a very, three very big topics, OCD, BDD, and hoarding. You'll probably be much more familiar with OCD and BDD. I'm going to try and uh, devote a little bit of time for each one of them, but by all means, feel free to interrupt me anytime if you want with any comments or questions. I'll try and make this a little bit more uh, entertaining, maybe. So I'll start with, uh, I'll start with a little bit of introduction of myself, just so you know why I'm talking about this. Um, I trained in Barcelona as a psychiatrist, and I was working at the National OCD unit in Spain. So when I had seen potentially maybe a good couple hundred patients with OCD, um, I realized that hoarding was supposed to be one of the symptoms of OCD, but I just hadn't seen any hoarders. So the opportunity came to come to the, to, to the Mosley Hospital at the Institute of Psychiatry, in UK to do a study on, on hoarding. So I just thought, well, this is going to be my opportunity to start seeing people with hoarding problems. Now that I am uh, perhaps becoming an expert in OCD, this is an element of OCD that I'm not very familiar with. So I came and I started going to the, home, to the homes of people who were theoretically hoarders. And they were indeed hoarders. You know, the homes were fully cluttered to the point where I had to sometimes climb to get into their homes. But they, they didn't seem to have OCD, they were content. They were happy, surrounded by their belongings. They weren't anxious like, uh, like the, the, a person with OCD tends to be generally. So that made me think that maybe hoarding was something different. So my supervisor at the time, Dr. Matash Coles, said, well, nobody's looked at this in detail. So that's why I decided to do a PhD, a PhD at the topic. But uh, I'll talk about that in, in just a moment. So there's something, I mean, there's two different classifications. I don't know if you're familiar with them. The DSM-5, which is the American classification, which uh, came out in 2013. And there is the ICD, which is the WHO classification, which is used around the world. Um, in the past, they have been, there have been differences between them. So that was hampering research. And also, it was a little bit of a nightmare with insurances and with trying to compare diagnosis. Uh, now the good news is that the ICD-11, which is going to come in a couple of, well, next year, uh, will be very similar to the DSM-5. So uh, both classifications are going, um, are going to include the so-called obsessive compulsive and related disorders, of which the three that I'm going to talk about, OCD, BDD, and hoarding, uh, are just three of these disorders. The ones that I won't talk about, but so you know are in the same category, are skin picking disorder, hair pulling or trichotillomania, hypochondriasis or health anxiety, uh, and a very interesting disorder that you may not have heard of. It didn't quite make its way into the DSM-5 due to lack of research because it's a relatively strange condition, very common in Japan for reasons that are, I'm not sure why, but it's uh, those people who feel that they have, that they emanate a full smell and that other people reject them for that reason. And of course, they, they, they tend to be completely clean and hygienic, and it, it, it tends to be almost like a delusional conviction that they have this problem, and this is called olfactory reference disorder. Um, and of course, sticks and Tourette's are also within this umbrella. Um, so I'll start with, with OCD. The reference to the swans, that there's, there's really no reference. I just thought it was nicer to use a beautiful image as opposed to the typical image of somebody doing like this or just in distress, just to make it a little bit, a little bit nicer. So there's no symbolism here intended. Um, so um, just by looking at this vignette, would anybody think of OCD in this case? Could you raise your hand if, you, if your first diagnostic impression would, would be OCD? So nobody's raised their hands. Um, could this be OCD potentially, or is it almost impossible that it would be OCD? Can anybody maybe tell me when they would think that this person has OCD? What else would this person have to have for you to think of OCD? Anxiety disorder. Anxiety disorder, yes. But what, what other behaviors would, you, would make you suspect, apart from this fear of the ceiling collapsing, which ceilings do collapse every now and then, not very often, but, but it can happen. Um, what other behaviours or thoughts should this person have for you to think, oh, this could be OCD? Because in the absence of anything else, we'd be thinking of GAD, generalised anxiety, just worrying about everything. Maybe counting ceiling tiles? Or? For example, uh, but not just counting them, but thinking that if he doesn't count them all, 
uh, then there is that sort of magical superstitious thinking, well, it's more likely to collapse or something like that. So if he feels, so um, OCD is about having a dreadful thought, premonition, suspicion, realization, and having to do something about it because it's unbearable. Um, and the thought can seem ridiculous to other people, but when you're having the thought, it doesn't seem ridiculous, it seems dreadful. So if you do something to counteract this thought, that's called a ritual or a compulsion, then I would be thinking of OCD. In this case, it's probably GAD, just probably generalized anxiety. But I thought it was a good example um, to illustrate the case. So the first symptom that we're going to talk about is the obsessions. Now, obsessions tend to be thoughts. They, they tend to come as a thought. Um, and I often give the, the example of, you know, in the old times of Windows XP, when the pop-up uh, error message would come and you would click on OK, but that thought would keep, I mean, that image would keep coming up. And there was no way to suppress that unless you reset it, uh, re reset the computer. So these thoughts are repetitive. Uh, and they could be something like, well, my hands are dirty because I've touched this. Or it could be an image. And generally, the images of people with OCD tend to be really distressing. Uh, they tend to have a sexual nature. And it could be something as horrible and uh, unacceptable as imagining yourself having uh, sex with your own daughter, which, which is something that I know sounds terrible. Uh, but people with OCD may experience these sort of thoughts. And it's not because they want to have them, it's generally people who are extremely ethical and have high moral values. And it's precisely the fact that the images they experience are so completely unrelated to the ethical values, uh, the fact that they find them so distressing. So it could be an image or it could be an urge. For example, um, I could have OCD and I could just feel compelled to just touch this table with both hands because otherwise it just doesn't feel right. And if you ask me, why did you do it? And I said, I don't know, I just felt compelled to do it. If I didn't do it, I just felt very uneasy. So OCD could come in, in, in all these formats, but we all, I mean, they're all defined as obsessions. Uh, they are what we call ego dystonic, which means you don't want to have them. And this is a difference with hoarding. People with hoarding feel quite happy around their possessions. We use the term ego syntonic for a symptom that the person feels okay with. Uh, things like addiction tend to be more ego syntonic. The person likes consuming the substance. Of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the person realizes that the substance is causing harm and stuff and it could become ego dystonic. But by definition, obsessions are really unwanted. I mean, nobody likes having uh, these mental uh, dreadful images or thoughts. Uh, they tend to be quite persistent. So what makes them different from general anxiety is the fact that you need to do something about them. They're just so unbearable to, to be with them. So that's how the compulsions or rituals come, come into place. Um, for example, if I wash my hands and I feel I'm clean, and I have an, an obsession that the door handle, particularly in a public toilet, uh, is contaminated, uh, just opening it with my elbow is in itself a compulsion. So, of course, washing your hands is a compulsion, but Avoiding touching it, it's also a compulsion. So if you ever think, oh, is this, um, is this a compulsion or not? There's many ways in which people with OCD will behave in a compulsive manner, and it could have to do with avoidance. Um, so compulsions tend to be quite repetitive as well. The, the very easy ones to identify are the physical ones when people check or arrange things in a very even way or wash their hands. Um, but, the, I mean, this is the tip of the iceberg. Most people with OCD struggle the most with mental acts or mental compulsions. Uh, very typically praying, uh, of course, men, praying in itself is not a compulsion unless you have to do it a certain number of times and you truly believe that something dreadful will happen if you don't pray. Counting mentally, uh, trying to remember information. It's very typical people with OCD trying to remember that they haven't harmed somebody inadvertently. Uh, or even killed somebody inadvertently, which sounds absolutely baffling, but um, I remember a patient who would have to every day empty the closet and just review everything to make sure she hadn't killed one of the neighbors and the pieces of the, of the body were just somehow hidden. Now it's almost impossible to do something like that and forget it, but uh, this is just to illustrate how strange OCD can feel when you, when you don't have it, but 
Um, if you get somebody with OCD describing their symptoms, it's quite important to be non-judgmental because sometimes they'll seem, they'll seem completely illogical to you, but they're dreadful for them and they'll tell you, yes, I know it's extremely unlikely that I've killed this, but that I've killed anybody, but I just, I just need to check, otherwise I cannot be. Um, so the aim of the compulsion or the ritual is always to reduce the anxiety, to feel right. It's like OCD puts a halt, the obsession stops your life. You feel so bad that unless you do the compulsion, you literally cannot carry it with your life. So, some people talk about pure O or pure OCD, um, which means you can have only obsessions and not compulsions. There's a little bit of debate in the scientific community as to whether that's actually a misnomer or not, because if, say, you have, um, like, for example, just pure, uh, like, obsessions and you don't have any observable compulsions, still you're probably going to avoid things or you're going to mentally um, do some degree of compulsions related to the thoughts you have, whether they are of a sexual nature or taboo thoughts. So I think it's extremely, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen uh, more than just a couple of people um, who I would say that, that they really had pure OCD, that they, they, they had obsessions and they didn't do anything to try and alleviate. A different thing is that they did rituals, mental rituals, that didn't work, but they at least tried. So the concept of pure O, I think, is a little bit of a misnomer, but it helps to illustrate patients with OCD who don't have any observable rituals. Uh, but I would suggest that generally, uh, patients with OCD will have both obsessions and compulsions, regardless of whether you see the compulsions or not. Um, so we... I mean, in the last few years, we've learned a lot about, about OCD, and we now know that there's different brain circuits that tend to be related to the different obsessions. So the contamination and cleaning um, type of obsessions tend to be perhaps the most prevalent ones, uh, but they can extend beyond the usual contamination. So for example, um, I mean, it's not uncommon at all for a, pe for a person with OCD to be fearful of um, being contaminated with cancer because somebody with cancer has been you know, has sat on a, on a certain chair and, and they're, they're well aware that cancer is not contagious but somehow it's just the, the their own memories about what it is like to have cancer um, somehow that they extend the contamination to that so um, the contamination is is just much more than the, the the general term that we tend to use in terms of you know just thinking about bacteria or viruses um, Contamination can have to do with religious issues as well. Very typical as well, obsessions and checking, having to make sure that the, the door is properly locked. Um, this could happen generally to avoid um, something bad from happening, uh, but it could happen just as a need to check that the door is locked and not because there's any fear. Now, it could get a little bit worse if somebody develops rituals with the so-called you know, superstitious thinking. So, for example, the, the, the dimension of symmetry and order, sometimes, say for example, I'm walking and entering a room, and then I have a, a, a bad thought about um, a member of my family just becoming ill. Uh, and that's an unacceptable thought. And people with OCD have an inflated sense of responsibility. So just having that thought makes them feel shameful, guilty, and even makes them think that maybe actually this person is going to develop this illness because I have this bad thought. They know it's not, it doesn't make any sense, but they'll still feel the fear. And the fear is really palpable. So very often they'll develop very idiosyncratic rituals. For example, they have to exit the room and start thinking about this family member in a radiant and healthy way, then enter the room again, holding that thought. And if they succeed, uh, then they can carry on with their lives. Now, try not to think of an elephant, right? I mean, it's, very, it's really difficult for them to actually carry out this draconian rituals in a proper way, which is why they end up often trying to, I mean, I mean it could take an hour for a patient with OCD to carry out a certain action, because they do the ritual over and over and over again. So it becomes extremely draining, and there's people who will ritualize or have compulsive behavior for, behaviors for maybe eight, ten hours a day, um, so this is a, a good example. I mean, we all talk about OCD, but seeing OCD in action can be very illustrative. Uh.
I've got no idea. I mean, this is taken from YouTube. I've got no idea what this, why this man is checking, whether he needs to do it a certain number of times, whether he's concerned that you know there's something going on that doesn't quite feel right. It's completely logical, but you'll see that he's in a loop. He just cannot carry out the action. It's just over and over and over. I mean, the video goes on for a few minutes. And you can see how he tends to do things in kind of like the same way. Uh, and of course, you know, the person who was kind of recording this video on YouTube was kind of also ma making a little bit of fun of this. But this person could, could be in very high distress, particularly if he's doing a ritual in a public place. The people with OCD tend to get extremely self-conscious and, and concerned. So this man is probably in huge distress. Uh, and, and we'd have to ask him why he's doing the things he's doing. There could be a superstitious reason behind it. Maybe he needs to do it 15 times and then it's well done. Who knows? Um, so this is, this is um, proper OCD in action. Um, just see if I can go back to the presentation. So um, it's, it's really worth talking about reassurance seeking. If you have a patient or a family member with OCD who, for example, locks the door and then you're with them and you're going to go and they say, oh, do you mind checking that the door's properly locked? It's quite, uh, because you know that they can get quite stuck doing it. It's quite easy to just say, yeah, sure, it's fine. Uh, but you're actually not doing them a favor if you do it because you, I mean, they, they'll delegate or outsource their own responsibility onto you. It will work out, but their OCD will not get any better. Uh, it does reinforce the OCD behaviors. The same goes for, you know, um, when they ask, oh, I didn't say this, right, did I? Or I didn't do that, right? Uh, the right way of doing, I mean, of dealing with these type of requests is by saying, well, you know that you have this OCD and that if you ask me, uh, you know, to provide reassurance, then I'm not helping you. So, you know, what do you think? Do you think you can cope with the anxiety? If the situation is really unbearable, of course, you're going to offer help. But in general, if it's a family member or a client that you're seeing often, uh, when the situation that they're seeking reassurance for is not terribly anxiety provoking, it's probably much better to actually teach them to overcome it on their own way. It's much harder, but, but you'll be helping them with their OCD as opposed to just making their OCD a little bit worse. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. So the treatment of OCD in the UK and generally in the guidelines around the world, unless the OCD is quite severe, it's really good to try therapy first and particularly it tends to be CBT uh, that is more associated with the best outcomes, post possibly because it's been the most researched um, type of therapy and it works really well with traditional OCD with obsessions and compulsions. Uh, but there's many other types of therapy like compassion, uh, like uh, um, compassion focused therapy or mindfulness or many other uh, variants of, of therapy which can be very useful for some clients. So um, CBT is, is, is quite helpful for standard OCD but very often therapists have to become a little bit more creative because OC the range of OCD presentations is almost infinite. So Sure. Yeah, that was going to be the next slide, actually. So the, the, the ERP is, is a very useful acronym because it's used quite often. It's one of the components of CBT for OCD, and it stands for Exposure and Response Prevention. Um, so it's not very different from things like agoraphobia or, or, or other anxiety disorders. Essentially, the vicious cycle of OCD is that you start here. I mean, you start with like a baseline of not feeling anxious. Um, and then something happens, you have a terrible thought or you touch something that you feel is contaminated. Let you, let's use the example of contamination because it's a very simple one. So I inadvertently touch something or shake hands with somebody and I'm really worried that I am contaminated. I need to go and wash my hands. So um, if, if I wait, the anxiety just goes up. Uh, if I wash my hands at some point, the anxiety dramatically drops and then I go back to the you know, baseline of no anxiety. But then of course, something will happen again. So I'll have anxiety again. I'll need to wash my hands again. So what ERP works with is, okay, if you don't do the ritual, if you, if you, if you wait, of course, this curve is perhaps not, not ideal because the anxiety goes up a lot before it starts going down. 
So people with OCD will feel that the anxiety is going to go up forever and that they'll probably end up dying of anxiety or that something dreadful will happen uh, and they really cannot cope with, at some point they just cannot cope and they'll do the ritual. So what ERP uh, tries to help uh, with is actually bearing with the anxiety until it peaks, it is unbearable, but, but bear with it, and then it will naturally just go down. So that's, that's the whole principle. How, how is that done? Of course, you have to start with, with simple things. Um, for somebody who uh, really dreads going, for example, to public toilets, that you cannot ask them to expose themselves to that. So the first thing that the therapist will do is to create what we call a hierarchy of symptoms. The patient will write down all the symptoms and together with the therapist will rate them um, from one when the anxiety is not terrible uh, or when it's kind of bearable to eight or even ten when the anxiety is almost you know, unbearable. So this is kind of a typical one but it will be different for every patient. For example, touching your own waist bin with rubber, uh, rubber globes on that could be something that's anxiety provoking, but you know, I kind of could do it if I had to. So you, you'll start with that, you'll ask the patient to do that, generally in front of the therapy, but also as a homework, you know, at home. And then when the patient gets proficient in, in just bearing with the anxiety and it's not so bad, then you kind of build your way up towards more anxiety provoking type of behavior. So that's the principle of ERP. If you look at it, it's not that different from things like agoraphobia, where, for example, a patient who is housebound, unable to leave their home, they'll probably start going with the therapist initially, say downstairs, just wait in the lobby or go around the block, and that's already anxiety provoking, but not as bad as going to the tube, for example, or going in a lift. So you build your way up. Essentially, the bottom line here is that uh, the more complacent patients are with their OCD, generally the worse the OCD gets and the more aspects of their life the OCD will, uh, will dominate. So this is, um, this is actually a little bit easier to understand than it seems. It's just a classical study comparing medication and therapy. So uh, generally in, in research uh, we use questionnaires just to see where the patient is initially and how much the patient has improved because otherwise it's very difficult to compare. So this is something called the white box, the yellow brown um, obsessive compulsive scale. So the, the starting point is 25. So we have three groups of people, all of them with severe OCD, so that you can get an idea. 25 means that you spend perhaps four or six hours a day doing rituals and that your level of distress and impairment is quite, quite high. So these are quite severe OCD patients. They all start with a score of 25. Some of them take placebo, and as you can see, it works a little bit, but literally just one or two points on the scale. So maybe they just report slightly less distress, but essentially their symptoms are untouched. That's a really interesting feature of OCD. It just doesn't respond to placebo, which speaks for a very strong biological basis. Um, another group took clomipramine, which is a strong medication. And they did get better, I mean, the, the final score was around 19, so maybe they were ritualizing for a couple of hours less a day, which is significant, a bit less distress, but still a score of 19 means the OCD is still impairing their lives big time. Now interestingly, those who, uh, took th those who did the therapy, the, the ERP, improved much more significantly to a score of about 13, uh, and this is the similar uh, similar outcome to those who combine medication and, and therapies. So therapy is actually extremely helpful for OCD. Um, if it's very severe, then yes, we'll use medication as well. But uh, think of therapy first, unless the, the, the OCD is really severe. Um, perhaps just very briefly discuss the medications for OCD. The, the, the standard medications for OCD will act on the serotonin uh, receptors of the brain. That's where we use the term serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They somehow enhance the, the ability of your own brain to recycle your own serotonin by preventing the neurons from destroying it after it's been released. Um, one of them is clomipramine, which is probably the strongest one and the most effective, but it's also associated with a lot of side effects, which we use only for quite treatment-resistant cases. Uh, and then we have the so-called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which are quite, quite well known like Prozac or Sertraline, etc.
I must say that the response to medication is quite good. So when you have a patient with OCD who wants to have medication, generally they tend to get much, much better. Uh, I mean, the, the, you, you see a very strong response in most cases. So what happens if somebody with OCD has done CBT and, and it didn't work for them? The first piece of advice is try it again. It could be that you did it at a time where you weren't motivated, that somehow you didn't connect with the therapist and it, it could happen, uh, or that the therapist maybe didn't have enough experience in OCD and didn't manage to tailor the treatment to your particular case. Um, so, exact, I mean, th there could be many reasons, so it's, it's really good to try again, particularly with CBT. Um, but if things don't work, there's many pharmacological approaches, and I, I probably won't go into much detail, but we can use uh, mega doses of SSRIs, of course, with appropriate monitoring, add uh, an antipsychotic medication for augmentation, which has also has quite good evidence base. But in all these cases, the side effects can become a burden. So, of course, it's about, I mean, for some people with OCD, their OCD is so dreadful that they won't mind even terrible side effects like dry mouth and sexual dysfunction. They'll often say, well, if the OCD gets better, doctor, I, I don't mind. So that's how, how much OCD can, can affect some people's lives. But of course, it's a balance between side effects and, uh, and, and level of functioning and distress. Um, there's a few other medications that are currently being researched, um, but the evidence is still quite preliminary. Uh, the psychosurgery at the bottom, um, it's, it's almost not being done anymore, but in the 80s and 90s, and we're not talking about lobotomies here or anything like that, uh, like in, you know, one floor over the cuckoo's nest. We're talking about just a resection of a small part of the brain which has to do with the OCD loop, but still it, it has side effects, you know, in terms of causing apathy and some other problems. So it's, it's become, of course, you know, um, not used anymore, but something that's quite relevant and interesting, and there's a, a brief video about that. Have you heard of deep brain stimulation? Possibly in the context of Parkinson's disease or, or even depression. So I'm just going to show you a video because uh, some people think that deep brain stimulation is something like extremely sophisticated, and it's actually a little bit more simple than, than you may think. So deep brain stimulation is a surgical technique. It's a procedure is we implant electrodes or wires in the brain in very specific areas and we use those wires to deliver a very fine electrical current to those regions of the brain in order to reduce the symptoms and the signs of Parkinson's disease and other movement. So I'll just explain, I mean these little things here is just like a pacemaker, it's just like a battery that emits the electricity. And the reason why it's there, it's because it's convenient. I mean, it needs to be somewhere and there's no space in the skull. So it, th that's the reason why sometimes it's used in the abdomen, but essentially it is similar to a, pace, a pacemaker. This is just the wire. Um, um, of course, it needs to get into the skull at some point and generally it tends to be uh, at the apex of the skull. Uh, and then there's a, a ultra thin um, a kind of wire that will connect with generally tends to be the nucleus accumbens or, or it tends to be a part of the brain and there's different targets uh, and that's where the electrode sits. So all it does is just emit an electrical current. There's, there's nothing else than that. There's no monitoring of, we don't see people's thoughts and we don't, it's, it's much less sophisticated than it looks. It's just a little bit of a current going on in a certain part of the brain but that seems to do the trick with many severe cases with OCC. The electrodes in the brain are connected up to a battery which is implanted under the skin just below the collarbone in most cases. That battery allows us to deliver a continuous small electrical current to the brain in a very controlled fashion in order to reduce the symptoms and signs of Parkinson's disease or other movement disorders. Despite the fact that it's called deep brain stimulation, in most cases we're not actually stimulating the brain, we're shutting down areas of the brain. By delivering uh, an electrical current, which is a fairly high frequency current, the nerve cells in the area of the electrode stop working. And that allows us to fairly reliably and accurately shut down a small volume of brain around 
a particular part of the electrode. So even though we're delivering an electrical current, we're actually inhibiting the brain or shutting it down rather than stimulating it. Parts of the brain that we're delivering electrical current to are thought to be participate. So we did that when I was working in Barcelona and I, I saw some spectacular <laughs> recoveries. I remember a young, a young chap with very, very severe OCD who became almost asymptomatic, almost free of symptoms. And um, we, we used to see them. I mean, we have like a small remote and the patient comes and the, the remote is like wireless and you can actually change the uh, direction, well not the direction, but you can change some parameters of the electrical current. And on one occasion he came back and he said, I've relapsed, I don't know what's happened. And we just figured out that he had gone into a mall and the magnets that are on the entrance somehow may have deactivated the machine. He didn't know why, but when he was in the mall, he started experiencing the symptoms quite bad again. So, I mean, that, that's just to give you an indication of how spectacular the effect can be. Um, at the moment, it's just reserved for very, very treatment resistant cases. But actually, the, the, I mean, apart from the, the complexity of the surgery, it doesn't tend to be associated with any particular side effect. So I believe probably in the future it will be used a little bit more frequently. And certainly in Parkinson's, it's starting to be used much, much more frequently. Um, so what happens with somebody with OCD? We tend to use the rule of a third. About one third will do quite well, and it tends to be people with an abrupt onset who have very episodic OCD, and they'll struggle maybe for a few months, and then they'll just get better, and, and they'll never come back. About one third of people will have like waxing and waning symptoms going up and down throughout their life, um, and in these people, treatment can help uh, during these periods. And about one third will have um, chronically deteriorating symptoms, or whether it's ongoing uh, in, the, in terms of its deterioration, or whether it's ongoing if, and the, the severity is stable, that depends on the person. But it's a, I think it's a significantly high proportion and it's quite unfortunate that over the last few years we haven't been able to, apart from the DBS, we haven't been able to develop perhaps other therapies or other medications that help uh, with, with severe OCD. So it's still a, a huge burden for some people. Um, just a few months back, I remember a patient telling me, I, I thought it was a very insightful way of putting it. So um, this patient had more mental obsessions and mental rituals. So whenever he thought he had found a way to beat his OCD, he just realized that the OCD very sneakily just went and presented him with another credible, a dreadful thought or obsession that he had to then battle with. So this is how he described it. And certainly in some cases, it, it tends to be that way. So just to finish with OCD, um, there's a lot of hype at the moment about the microbiome or microbiota. I don't know if you know the difference between these terms. The word microbiome is the word that everybody uses, but it's actually the word microbiota that they mean. So microbiota is just the bacterial population in the gut. The microbiome is the, the, all the genes of these populations. Uh, but essentially the, the word microbiome has, you know, has succeeded, so everyone, everyone uses that term. So whenever you hear the word microbiome, just think about the, the bacterial population living in your gut. And you've probably heard that it's terribly important, not just in obesity and in things like IBS, but also in mental health, addictions, um, compulsive eating, uh, but even anxiety. So all we know at the moment is that people with OCD actually have a slightly different population of bacteria. Why is that and what to do with that? That's still possibly a little bit far away. The problem with uh, studies in the microbiome is that, I mean, there's millions of species of bacteria. So you have to think just like the brain with lots of neurotransmitters and, 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 and neurocircuits. It's just almost, in, I mean, it's a very reductionistic approach to say, well, here is a probiotic, just take the probiotic, take the bacteria. Uh, it, it has a lot of bacterial populations. You could be making some things worse. So, it, I mean, of course, I don't think it's terribly risky, but I think the problem with the, with the, perhaps the most recent research in terms of the microbiome and the functional medicine is that there's a little bit of preliminary science, but we just don't know enough that we can apply it to individual cases, but it certainly looks really promising. Um, we're going now on to BDD, and again, no, no intention <coughs> in terms of the picture. So, any questions about OCD so far? 
So BDD is a really, really fascinating uh, condition. Uh, the, the, the concept, the main concept of BDD is, is that people are very preoccupied. They're almost obsessed, constantly thinking about a flaw or a defect. Now, of course, I mean, when you ask them and they explain it to you, very often you really struggle to understand what they mean. You, really? I mean, something wrong with your nose? I mean, I'm not sure I can see it. And then they explain and it becomes quite obvious that it seems to be very much a perceived defect. Of course, sometimes you'll find a small blemish or, or a very slight defect, but nothing that you'd consider conspicuous or, or, or terrible enough to warrant, you know, such amount of preoccupation. Uh, of course, if somebody does have a real defect and it looks obvious that you know that, that could affect their appearance, you wouldn't ever be diagnosed in BDD. It needs to be either a perceived defect or something that's clearly slight. And it, it's generally not that difficult to, to assess this. It, it tends to be something quite minor. Uh, but for, for people with BDD, it, I mean, in their brains, it's, it's the only thing they can see. Um, once this preoccupation develops, the person will do something similar to the OCD rituals, uh, generally mirror checking just to see the extent of the defect, to see if it's still there, to try and, and see what they can do to camouflage it. Uh, they'll generally wear heavy makeup. Um, they'll do mental acts in terms of comparing themselves to other people, skin picking as a way to, I mean, to maybe disguise the defect, uh, excessive grooming. Um, so again, to diagnose BDD, apart from having these symptoms, you always need to have a certain degree of distress or impairment. If, if that isn't there, then you, you could say the person has BDD traits or OCD traits, but unless the distress and impairment are not there, we wouldn't be just pathologizing. I mean, we've all had some concerns, you know, when we have, uh, when, when we have acne and things like that, we just feel very self-conscious, but it tends to last for a certain amount of time and it doesn't tend to affect us so much. If that lasts for a long time and it's really distressing, that's when you make the diagnosis. So somebody, yes. Yes. Yeah, of course. So yeah, traditionally BDD and eating disorders have been very much lumped because you could consider that uh, you could you could conceive anorexia as a form of BDD whereby you see yourself as fat whilst you're thin. Um, but the classification systems have decided um, just not too long ago to, uh, rather than lumping them, to make them separate and to consider any concerns regarding uh, physical appearance and, and, and kind of body composition as an eating disorder. Although the similarities with BDD, they're, they're very obvious and actually they tend to coexist eating disorders and BDD. Um, unless we're talking about muscle dystrophia, which I'll, sorry, dysmorphia, which I'll talk about in a moment, if you have somebody who's only concerned about their physical appearance in terms of the fat um, and kind of body composition, then it wouldn't be BDD. You, you think about oh, um, eating disorders instead. But the overlapping is massive. Yeah. Um, so somebody with BDD will really look, oh sorry, yes. Sorry, I was going to ask. Is there any extent to which you see OCD or BDD as being on the spectrum of psychotic disorders? I saw you saw it's a really good question, yeah. Um, in the past, um, we had like a de delusional yeah. BDD category yeah. and even delusional OCD category. But the research uh, shows that the outcome is not that different uh, and the symptoms are not that different. And we now talk in terms of level of insight. So the DSM-5 has a specifier uh, in OCD as well as in BDD, and the specifier is about insight. So you have three categories, good or fair insight, um, moderate insight, or absent insight slash delusional, which I think the word delusional can, can be a little bit tricky. Um, sometimes OCD can be so wacky. I mean, the symptoms of OCD, you, you wouldn't believe that, that, I mean, some of the stories you hear when you work in an OCD clinic, it can look like a psychosis. So occasionally the differential diagnosis may be tricky. But when it's OCD, it's clearly OCD. And we tend not to use the word delusional or to consider it as a psychosis. But some cases are very, very much borderline between psychosis and OCD. I would agree, but generally, nowadays, we tend to not use the, the term delusional unless we're referring to the insight. Okay, thank you.
So somebody with BDD, they'll look at themselves in the mirror and they truly will see their defects. And to be honest, I'm, 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 to an extent, unfortunately, they tend to be right. Because uh, have you never looked at yourself in the mirror long enough to realize that you're quite imperfect? Or maybe it's just myself, quite asymmetrical. And then you use a mirror and then you realize, like, you look at both sides of your face and you, oh, one side is like, when I, if I, if I had sp both sides completely symmetrical, I'd look like a, like a model. Uh, I mean, look, look, look at a picture next time you can uh, with a mirror, and then you'll see that uh, if you replicate one side of the face on, on the mirror so that your face looks completely symmetrical, uh, that person will probably look like really, really well. So, um, but most people are just not symmetrical. Uh, but we're just so used to looking at ourselves and just, you know, disregarding these little imperfections. So we know that people with BDD actually are able to pay more attention to detail and that they're actually better than the average person at recognizing the little flaws, the asymmetries and stuff. So they're actually right in that uh, small defects are more salient for them and they just focus on them much more. So this is what somebody with BDD um, will see when they look at themselves. Of course, it's an, it's an exaggeration, but if you spend too much time looking at something, uh, you start, I mean, you stop seeing it as a whole, as a face. You just see it as a collection of uh, deformed features if you, if you overdo it, which is what happens when they look at this, themselves in the mirror too much. So it can range from, uh, I don't look right, or I'm even ugly, to, to actually thinking that they're hideous or even deformed. And I've had people telling me that, that we're actually reasonably attractive or, or absolutely attractive and, and it's completely unfathomable for somebody who doesn't suffer from BDD. But again, you know, that's why sometimes uh, the word delusional has been used, but it's, it is an anxiety or a, a, an OCD kind of spectrum disorder. Um, generally, it tends to be the face and mostly, mostly the skin, um, lines, wrinkles, um, feeling that you're too pale, scars, um, thin in hair, baldness, excessive body hair. The nose tends to be also a really typical concern of somebody with BDD. To the extent that they feel that everything people, I mean somebody for example with a, some redness in the nose which is a relatively common facial feature for some people, um, if they're very self-conscious about it they'll, they, they'll even avoid going up because they feel that they're a walking nose and that everybody's just looking at their nose and the anxiety is probably going to be quite unbearable. Um, so that some, somebody with BDD <coughs> tends to have such degree of distress that actually it's one of the conditions uh, with, a, with a higher um, suicide rate, interestingly, and, and with the highest level of chronicity and impairment. Uh, surprisingly, it's even more prevalent than OCD, but we don't see that. I mean, I mean even though I see lots of people with OCD and um, I don't get many patients or many referrals with BDD. Is it because they don't exist? Probably not. It's because they don't feel they have a mental health problem or that they can be helped. And they just feel they need to go to, to a dermatologist or to a cosmetic surgeon. So that's where they tend to go, actually, not, not to seek help with a therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, it tends to start quite early, um, generally in the teenage years. It tends to become quite chronic. It's, again, the burden of disability of BDD is enormous, um, but it can start at literally any age, um, as young as five or as old as 80. Um, and you'll normally see people with BDD in dermatology settings, cosmetic surgery. Um, of course, people with OCD are more prone to BDD as well, um, and social phobia, and also substance abuse tends to be very, very often associated with BDD. Now, the bottom line with BDD is, uh, if you suspect it, unless you ask, people will not volunteer it. They, they just won't, won't, won't say, oh, I've got BDD, or I'm so worried about my nose. They just won't say it, so you need to actually scream for it. Yes? The onset of, uh, uh, of BDD, I mean, is it earlier as compared to OCD, or there's, there's no correlation? Any? It tends to be earlier for BDD. Uh, earlier and more chronic. Um, for OCD, it's not, not uncommon at all to see somebody in their 30s have a first. I mean, OCD is up to 30, 35. It's, uh, it's possible. But I would say BDD generally earlier. Generally. Thanks. So, 
Um, when should you suspect? Oh, sorry, yes. Uh, sorry, just a really quick question because in my mind at the moment, so um, I work at the moment mainly with gay men yeah. and BDD comes up, linked with eating disorders actually, uh, comes up shockingly, uh, alarmingly, um, a, a lot. And I know that there's, there's studies now being done around the bigger picture around LGBT mental health, but specifically the gay men and BDD, um, which of my clients I have is linked to body, but it's also linked to sex. Um, and that's what I'm just wondering, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that or, or possibly. Most definitely, yes. Uh, uh, perhaps a prototypical client uh, that I see with BDD would, would be a gay man who has BDD traits or full-blown BDD who tends to have substance misuse, particularly GHB or liquid ecstasy, which is a, a, a drug that, that people take to just feel a bit more social or open or to numb their feelings. Um, they very often will have muscle dysmorphia as well, which we will talk about in a moment. Uh, just to compensate for that perceived defect, they'll try to look as muscular as they can because it's, your muscles are one of the very few things that you can reasonably change with exercise so that they'll try and hypercompensate. Very often they'll have issues with intimacy and they're not able to have any intimate relationships unless they use drugs and that's where the substance misuse, particularly alcoholism um, as well, can come in. Often you'll see uh, quite severe social phobia which is very much linked to this, you know, BDD traits, um, and particularly in some cultures like the Middle East, because being gay, of course, is, is, is culturally much more problematic in certain countries, that can aggravate symptoms very much. So that tends to be a formula, of course, it's um, hyper-simplifying, but uh, that tends to be a type of formulation that I see relatively often. Uh, so I think BDD actually may be more, may be more free, I'm not sure that there's studies, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was more common in the in the gay community. Uh, absolutely, but for all, for all the reasons that you mentioned, with the, with the, the link to chems. Uh, yes. Phenomena of chem sex and what that goes with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just I just wondered if clearly you've experienced that with your heart. Definitely, and and some of them. Um, they need to, I mean, they're only able to have uh, sexual relationships in the context of um, sometimes even orgies where they have to wear masks uh, and where, where it's all dark and people are completely wasted on drugs and that's the, the, the environment where, they, I mean, some of them develop paraphilias as well or have issues with, with pornography because they, they cannot relate on a face-to-face -face basis so they end up being addicted to just pornography. I think the ramifications are huge. Uh, but even if you don't suspect a full BDD, um, suspe I mean, people with BDD traits are quite, I mean, it's quite frequent to find people with BDD traits. And the, the times when you should suspect it is generally when people try to disguise their appearance uh, by wearing, you know, sunglasses when it's inappropriate or uh, baggy clothes, uh, you know, caps or hats. Uh, sometimes a tattoo can be a way of disguising a perceived defect. Um, of course, camouflage makeup tends to be a very, very typical way of doing it. Hair covering your face. Um, if they always sit in a certain way, trying to give you a certain side because it, the good side and the bad side, it seems silly. Uh, but some people can be really obsessed with that. Eye contact, you know, they feel very socially anxious. Um, so essentially, it's about being very non judgmental and kindly say, you know, are you, are you bothered by your appearance? You wouldn't do that maybe on the first session, but when the person trusts you a little bit more, if you suspect any of that, it's, it's a good idea to bring it up. And if they say yes, then of course the first thing you need to do is find out where the, where the perceived defect is, so you can see whether it's objective or not. Often you'll see the person and you'll think, oh, it, it must be the nose. And then it's actually not. It's, 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 they think their hair is too thin, and you'll be like, really? I mean, I thought you'd be worried about your nose. You have an idiosyncratic <laughs> nose, but it's not, uh, which tells you how random it can be. It's, it's, it's far from objective. It's really nothing to do with, with how you see them. It's how they see themselves. So uh, once you've identified that the perceived defect is not so objective, then, of course, you know, you, you try and find out, oh, do you spend a lot of time in the mirror? Do you really get very distressed? Is this affecting your life? Are you not going out enough because of this? Uh, and if they start saying yes and opening up, then you probably know that's, that's an area of concern. Um, actually, I mean, people with BDD can get much better. Although they don't respond as well to medication as, as, as OCD does, uh, they do respond reasonably well to therapy. Uh, 
Um, so um, the, actually the BDD Foundation um, website has a lot of interesting resources if you ever want to read about it or recommend it to, to patients. So in terms of treatment, again, we're going for therapy first because it's the best research evidence and it's the more, the more long-lasting results. Uh, the, the formulation is much more complex than with, with OCD and I won't get into that much detail um, and it, because it depends a lot on the, on the client. Um, but sometimes you can add a little bit of medication like an SSRI, but generally uh, it just won't be as, as effective. Is there a personality disorder which is more associated with BDD as compared to, you know, let's say with OCD? That's a good question. Um, I would say that the typical personality features of somebody with OCD, as well as with BDD, tends to be somebody like in a very anal type of personality, very perfectionism, meticulous in their approach, high moral values, uh, inflated sense of responsibility. Um, somebody who tends to be very neurotic and prone to rumination and to anxiety, uh, very much in, in the introspection side of things. So I would say this tends to be the personality type for both um, ADD and, and OCD. Is it the anacastic type? Sorry, BDD and OCD. Uh, oh, anacastic. Yeah, I mean, yeah well, I mean, the term anacastic now is almost a little bit anachronistic. I mean, it's, it's, on, the D, it's on the ICD-10. And it's the, the European equivalent of the obsessive compulsive personality disorder of DSM five, which is now of DSM four, which is now no longer used. But yes, there's a lot there's a lot of overlap between OC, OCPD or obsessive compulsive personality and both BDD and OCD. Uh, but the I mean the personality and psychopathology can sometimes be on a continuum, so it's it's quite difficult sometimes to disentangle which is which. But yes, you tend to see BDD in, pe in people with that sort of personality, but not always, not always. Um, surgery, I mean, what happens when somebody with BDD uh, who has issues about the shape of their nose wants to have surgery? I mean, intuitively you think, oh, amazing, they, you know, they, they fix their nose, fix the problem. But unfortunately it's not that way, it tends to be actually the opposite. Like they tend to get aggravated, they tend to get worse. The surgery is never pleasing for them. They'll find another defect or they'll be more unhappy. So generally, it's, a, it's not an absolute contraindication, but generally, uh, you should not advise surgery. I mean, you should advise the person with BDD to discuss with the surgeon and with the psychiatrist or therapist and to actually have a joint discussion as to whether surgery is actually going to make things worse. Um, and it's quite, it's, I mean, the case of Michael Jackson is a little bit controversial because if you read online, you know, some people say, I mean, he had vit vitiligo, so he had problems in the skin, and that's what prompted some of the initial surgeries. But it's quite obvious that um, he was never happy surgery after surgery. So um, it's generally quoted as a case of BDD, and as an example of how surgery doesn't necessarily make people happy, and it just becomes a bit of an addiction. Um, there's an interesting paper published by David Veal in which he explains some of the DIY kind of um, surgery, surgical procedures that desperate people with BDD have done, that he's witnessed, from super gluing your ears to, um, you know, trying, if you have a, like a double chin or a saggy kind of uh, cheeks, just, you know, stapling your own skin or, or using some paper as a form of peeling, uh, exsanguination, which is just trying to bleed uh, trying to you know get as much blood out of your system to try and look paler. Uh, th it's quite dreadful, but it talks about the level of desperation that people can do just to, to address the perceived defect. Um, so the prognosis of BDD is generally worse than in OCD. Of course, it varies individual, individually, but it tends to be much more chronic, uh, much more disabling, and the suicide rate is really, really high. So about one-fourth of people with uh, full-blown BDD will attempt suicide at some point throughout their lives. So that tells uh, a lot about the, that says a lot about the level of desperation. Um, it's like not being able to live on your own skin, literally, uh, in your own skin. So um, it's quite frequent for people to resort to, particularly alcohol, I would say, but some other mind-numbing type of drugs, uh, or of course recreational drugs, when they, when they go out as a way to just be able to cope uh, with the huge social anxiety caused by the BDD. Um, 
and then muscle dys, uh, dysmorphia is um, is a specifier now in the DSM-5. So you, if you have the muscle dysmorphia, that's just like another uh, subtype of, of BDD. You're still diagnosed with BDD. Generally, it tends to be quite muscular people who spend many hours in the gym. The studies suggesting that even 10% of gym goers have muscle dysmorphia. It looks like a little bit exaggerated, but to me, but it depends on where you set the threshold. Um, but it tends to be quite quite bulky people who just feel uh, that they're not strong enough. So sometimes people refer to this as a reverse anorexia because it literally looks the opposite or, or bigorexia. Um, again, it's a subtype of BDD and people tend to use steroids and that's what, what one of the risks may be. Uh, but this one perhaps is a little bit more egosyntonic in that uh, people don't feel so distressed as with the, the standard BDD uh, and all they do is just you know, go to the gym like crazy, uh, but they're not so socially conscious of, of their, uh, they're not so impaired as in standard BDD, although it depends. So we don't tend to see that so much in the clinic. Um, that's the last bit of the presentation, uh, a Zen garden, the, the epitome of order. Yeah, so hoarding. Um, the first thing that may come to mind is, you know, why, why are you calling it hoarding disorder? Isn't, isn't this compulsive hoarding? We, don't, we always use the term compulsive hoarding, and the term is now no longer being used because compulsive hoarding suggests that the behavior is somehow linked to obsessive compulsive behavior, and, and we just know that this is no longer the case. So you'll hear the term hoarding disorder much more, um, and compulsive hoarding is kind of perhaps not very accurate of a term. So we've discussed earlier about OCD and the typical symptoms that somebody with OCD can have. So up until about 2008, we used to think of hoarding at, at just one of the dimensions of, of, of OCD, just like you had contamination and washing or symmetry and checking, you had hoarding. Uh, and that was just like a bit like a dogma. And we don't know exactly how this originated, but for since the 60s, maybe, just hoarding was supposed to be a symptom of OCD. Um, now, if you look at, uh, I don't know if you can see it, it she's just, he's just saying, well, you're not one of these hoarders, are you? So if you look at her, the, the prototypical image of a hoarder, it tends to be like an affable, quite content person. So, I mean, if you look at the documentaries, they tend to be uh, at home, surrounded by their possessions. Uh, they don't tend to feel particularly anxious or worried. Of course, if you try to remove their items, they'll, they'll get very anxious, but unless you do that, in a normal day-to-day -day life, they're just quite happy picking things up, newspapers and things, bringing them <coughs> home, um, and just feeling at home quite content. It's a very egosyntonic condition, a little bit like addiction, so that's why uh, they don't want treatment, and it, it tends to be like a family intervention to try and get them to, uh, to, to do any treatment. So that gives you an idea of how different it is from OCD. If you see a documentary of somebody with OCD, you see distress comes across as, you know, as the pervasive problem. So um, up until you know, 2006 or 2007, constant scientific papers assuming, <coughs> assuming that, sim that just hoarding was like a symptom of OCD, even genetic studies lumping hoarding with OCD. So the research before 2008 was, was a little bit tricky because it wasn't able to extract many conclusions. Conclusion. So what we did during the PhD was try and, I mean, we, we got a large sample, it took a long time to recruit 50-something people with, with severe hoarding problems that we visited at home and we assessed to see whether they had any OCD symptoms, uh, the level of distress, the, you know, we used all sorts of questionnaires and clinical interviews just to uh, understand their symptoms as much as possible and see whether they actually were comparable. Um, Long story short, the conclusion was clearly that it was just two different entities that, uh, of course, they had some overlap, just like BDD and OCD can have an overlap, uh, but essentially hoarding was considered after that by the DSM-5. Well, I mean, other groups started replicating the same results, so the DSM-5 in 2013 thought there was enough evidence to consider that it was a different disorder, and we just decided to coin, uh, I mean, to, to use a different term like hoarding disorder, and the ICD-11, which is going to come next year, uh, will also include a very similar diagnosis, and the diagnostic criteria are almost the same. Um, and it's also within the obsessive-compulsive kind of category. So how do you diagnose somebody with hoarding? 
the first thing that will come to, to mind is, I mean, you just need to see the clutter, right? Um, I mean, of course, you wouldn't just use this, but generally when you see this, unless, you know, the person says, oh, you know, this is just my holiday home and I'm just in the process of cleaning or anything like that, this is just temporary, you could think, okay, fine. But generally, if you see this, you'll probably suspect, oh, this person's a holder. Um, so we don't need to go in detail with the diagnostic criteria, but just highlight what features you, you need to have to actually do the diagnosis. The first one is difficulty discarding. So some people think hoarding is about just grabbing everything, but not really. I mean, the amount of waste that a normal human being generates on a normal day, just from empty containers and food containers and rapid pages and uh, junk mail, brochures, newspapers, uh, if you stop discarding things, uh, I can assure you that within a couple of months or even earlier, your house will be cluttered. There's, there's no way that you can store all that waste. So it's about difficult dis discarding. So it's about feeling that um, you cannot get rid of this newspaper, uh, generally because there's something interesting on it that I haven't managed to read now, but I'll, at some point I'll read it. But then you have thousands of old newspapers dating back 20 years ago, which you'll objectively never read, but it's the what if. So it is not that different uh, from the reasons why all of us may decide to hold on to things. You know, Things may come in handy in the future, um, even though I haven't used it for a long time, or it, it's actually valuable, it should be kept, or there's a, a sentimental value to it, it belonged to whoever, or these are the clothes of my children when they were young, I just want to keep them because they have a lot of memories. So we've all been there, but we managed to have a good balance uh, between discarding and, and things getting into our houses. Um, people with uh, hoarding disorder, they just, this balance has shifted towards then not discarding anything. And by anything I mean sometimes even their own feces in the, in the, most, in the most severe cases. Um, and of course the, the house has just become cluttered. So it's the difficulty discarding would be the, ho the hallmark, hallmark of, of, of hoarding. Of course that needs to result into clutter. Um, and it's not just about the, the, uh, the, the dwelling being cluttered. But it's also about the spaces not being a, not being usable. For example, kitchens not being fit for cooking because they're just completely crammed with stuff. Uh, beds being filled with things so that people actually need to sleep in the sofa or in a chair for many years because the bed is just completely piled up with stuff. So when there is functional impairment, we then decide, okay, this could be hoarding disorder. The reason why when we drafted the diagnostic criteria on the DSM-5 task force, we wanted to put a relatively high threshold because psychiatrists in general, and particularly the DSM-5, have been criticized of pathologizing normal human behavior. We're all a bit of holders or collectors, so why you know, discriminating people and saying that they have a mental condition? So that's why we did the criteria reasonably high, I mean, in the threshold reasonably high. I mean, if somebody is not able to use living areas of their home because they're uncluttered, they have significant distress or impairment, they're not able to bring people in, wash themselves, <coughs> uh, then of course you're talking about pathology here. It goes beyond the normal you know, variation of human behavior. So how do you measure clutter in an objective way? Because it's such a subjective thing. And it's deliberate that I have uh, written the word clutter in that way. So clutter is not about the amount of items or objects in a room. It's about how they are completely scattered around the place. So we even have a questionnaire to measure clutter. Um, and of course, this would be uh, a dream room that very few people will have. Uh, this would be probably a room of somebody with ADD, probably. Um, this could be starting to look like the room of somebody who is really disorganized, maybe has an addiction problem, but not so much a hoarding problem. Four or five would be more hoarding territory. If you see somebody who lives in a place like this, or even worse, uh, and it could be even like a nine, where you, you literally cannot enter the room because it's piled up with stuff. Um, again, we don't make the diagnosis just on the basis of a single score, like five or above is hoarding, but this is just a way for us to also measure the degree of clutter. Certainly less than a five or a four, it would almost rule out the diagnosis. Yes? Can I ask why you said number two, um, just eight? Sorry, uh, um, it, it, someone with, with ADD who who has 
uh, a level of disorganization such that they're not able to um, to kind of keep keep a tidy environment. But but uh, it, I mean, interestingly, there's a lot of links between ADD and, and hoarding. And actually, what we see is that people with ADD often tend to come across as hoarders, but it's more the disorganization and the lack of organizational skills. And they tend to maybe once every few months just go and arrange everything and, and you know and discard ten uh, bags of rubbish filled with stuff and, and, and have a completely rearranged environment. But then it starts getting bad again, and after a few months, you know, it tends to look like this again. But of course, no two people with ADD are the same. I didn't imply that necessarily. Yeah. Oh, definitely, yes. Um, yeah, I think you'd be looking at the number nine, maybe, for a normal teenage room, <laughs> even beyond hoarding, yes. I think you were saying that six and above was the hoarding and below that. Or even five, five, even five. But it so much depends on the person. So this is, a bit, I mean, uh, so in order to assess hoarding, sorry, yes? Here's my question. It might be that you're saying that six and above and maybe even five, but the reality is probably below those numbers Yeah, definitely. So, from the perspective of diagnosis, isn't it better to start to recognise the symptoms of it before they begin to get life threatening, which some of these are because there's some risk of fire and risk of breaking legs. So, I'd say there's a good chance that four is already, you know, the, the symptoms are there. Most definitely. I mean, if you suspect it, even if the dark, even if the clutter is not as intense, particularly in children, you know, because their parents will prevent them from ac accumulating too many things or if you leave, if you share a, a room with somebody or if, if, if there's external reasons why you cannot accumulate things or it takes many years often to, to build up so many possessions, by all means if you can intervene um, that would be a really really good idea. It just doesn't tend to happen very often uh, and unfortunately we tend to see cases, I mean I have done a lot of medical legal reports on proceeding, uh, kind of evictions proceedings and, and I tend to see very, very dramatic cases where local authorities uh, will kind of evict people. Um, so if you saw this picture, um, if you could raise your hand if you think this man probably has holding disorder. A few of you, but many of you didn't raise your hand. So um, this is a talk about holding, right? Why, why should I use an image without... Uh, anybody who didn't raise their hands maybe uh, cares to tell us why. Reasonably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, pla a place here to walk. Uh, things seem to be reasonably organized. Uh, so, if I was to look at this, I'd be like, this could be a case, but at my first inclination would be that probably he doesn't have hoarding. Of course, you'd have to look at the other rooms and see how cluttered they are. You'd have to see whether he can sleep on his bed, use the kitchen for cooking, uh, use the, the toilet normally. And, and take all that into account, just on the basis of a single room you wouldn't. But it looks like this is more somebody who, who likes collecting things and, uh, and, and is maybe a mild hoarder, but certainly not a serious, no, I wouldn't probably say that he's got hoarding disorder. That, that is someone's home, it's not a shop. It looks a bit like a shop. A um, to be honest, I took this from the internet, so I don't know whether, whether this is a shop or a home. But, but the idea was that, I mean, it seems very cluttered, but it doesn't seem, I mean, um, I mean I'll mean, i show you other pictures later and you, you, you'll understand, but uh, even if it looks like there's many items, you don't have to suspect hoarding in e initially. You have to consider kind of a bigger picture. Is so, it to do with functionality, really? A bit oh, very much so, very much. And yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Very much so. But it looks like this gentleman is able to find what he wants to find. Things are not piled up in that way. Yes? Um, just to kind of follow on from that point, it's just a question about the, the organisation or disorganisation of a clutterer. So even, I mean, clutter is in my family, uh, so it's really resonating with me. But even in that kind of organised chaos, to me, I look, that overwhelms me. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even though, absolutely, as you said, it's got some hard ways, but it's all. Um, so I'm going back do you mind just going back to the previous slide for a moment? I just had a question about the This one, yeah. Yeah, so, so in four and five, or maybe three and four, you, you also mentioned, I think, you talked about this could be an addict, an addict's bedroom. Mm -hmm. 
which now that really resonates with me because that's my bedroom in active addiction. I was in active addiction for and by possibly, but that's I recognise that in terms of disorganisation, chaos, yes. unmanageability. So I'm just wondering where the, 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 the if there's a line between organised chaos and disorganised chaos. Most definitely, and the next few slides are precisely going to. To, to, to discuss that in much more detail. I think you'll find you'll find them very illustrating. My heart's beating already. Yes. Well, I was do you treat many people on the autistic spectrum with OCD as well? Well, in, in and I also because my partner has Asperger's, and the, it, it's not like that. But I mean, he doesn't want to get rid of things. You know, it's a real problem for him to get. He gets very distressed. So precisely, I mean, one of the studies we did with, with hoarding was the relationship between hoarding and ASD and autism, uh, and because there tends to be a huge overlap. What we found out is that people on the autistic spectrum have a tendency to hoard, but generally for different reasons. It's more close to collectionism. They tend to have special interests that they get really, really into, and they tend to accumulate everything that, that has to do with that, but they tend to be much more organized. Of course, at some point, if you have limited space, and um, too many items, it, it becomes really difficult to, to not, for, for things not to get cluttered. Mm -hmm. But it, it is similar to hoarding, but it's a, it's a different reason. So we, we wouldn't use the term hoarding disorder. It would be a symptom of the ASD to do with the special interest. Yeah. Um, so let's look at another picture. I mean, this, this looks like bona fide hoarding. You know, things are completely chaotically just, you know, whatever they felt, that's where they are. Uh, and it's very inefficient. If, if you spend a few hours here and, and could use the shelves in a more efficient way of use a cupboard or anything, it could be that you may be able to actually fit the great majority of these items, maybe not all of them, but the great majority so that the space would look a little bit more organized. Now you'll be like, oh, why is the hoarder not doing it here? Well, it's because they, they don't have the ability. That's why we think that hoarding is also linked to uh, difficulties in organization and some neuropsychological difficulties. It's not just uh, that they want to have this environment, it's that they don't manage to, to have a different environment. So if they're looking for something, they may spend 20 minutes just churning things and just, just taking stuff and of course they, they'll disorganize the, the pile. So keeping things organized is almost impossible for them. And that's why sometimes in their open, if they're open to people like professional organizers um, to help them, they can get much better, particularly if they're not very severe cases. So I would, if you showed me this picture, I would be inclined to say that this person probably has hoarding disorder, but if this is just like a basement and the rest of the house is okay, mm -hmm. I'd be like, well, this person has just a very disorganized basement, but they don't have hoarding disorder. Of course, they'll have some tendencies because you need to at least have tendencies to have this basement, but I wouldn't make the diagnosis or anything based just on a picture. I'd need to see the whole, the whole situation. Um, this is much more likely to be hoarding disorder um, there's some differences between men and women, and of course, you know, uh, it, it varies a lot, but women tend to be more sentimentally attached, and they tend to hoard clothes um, and, and, and some other items as opposed to men who will get attached more to practical items. So this is quite typical hoarding, and it's reasonably organized. You'll see that there's a little pathway here, and then things are piled up to use the space as good as, I, as, as she can, but this is a very typical um, house of, of kind of room of, of, of a hoarder. Um, so what do you do when somebody has hoarding disorder? Um, this is the same room. Um, some people think that forceful kind of decluttering uh, clearance kind of interventions can help. I mean it helps objectively but you traumatize the person. I mean, you should never do it because the, the amount of people I've seen who were traumatized because somebody thought it was a good idea to do a forceful decluttering. And this happens particularly with elderly people who can be a little bit more vulnerable. Or social, local authorities evicting people are just forcefully decluttering their houses because, you know, I'm the landlord, I can do it. So it's, it's really tricky. I mean, it, it should never be done because it can cause quite, quite severe and enduring trauma. Uh, I mean, all these possessions, which may seem completely useless for, for us, will have enormous meaning for, for, the, for the hoarder. Um, what we do is interventions, literally, very, very similar to addictions. You use the motivational model of Procesca and Clementi, and you find out whether the person is pre-contemplative, contemplative, or where they are 
uh, in terms of wanting to address their problem. So motivational interviewing tends to be uh, you know, the way to go at least initially. So normally it'll be the spouse or a family member or, you know, or a court proceeding or some sort of reason why the hoarder will come to you or the person with hoarding problems will actually want any sort of treatment. Very rarely it's going to be the person wanted, wanting treatment. Um, even if their life is really impaired, it's such an egosyntonic condition that they just, they just feel okay, they don't want any change. So very few cases I have seen a, a person with hoarding disorder actively seeking for treatment themselves. Um, medication, there's a few studies, but honestly I've never seen anybody respond to medication. and I'm, I'm not sure that I think these, these studies are methodologically correct, so I wouldn't use a medication at all. Of course, if they have clinical depression, then I may think about using an antidepressant if it's pertinent, but it's, it's definitely not a condition that will respond to medication. Um, it's again psychological treatment, um, and generally CBT is the best one, and there's a version of CBT that's modified for hoarding. There's like a manual, and there's, there's quite a few studies. Perhaps not many, but over the last five years we have quite good evidence, including a meta-analysis, that although the gains are marginal, you, you cannot experience a dramatic recovery because we're talking uh, people with hoarding, um, they've been normally hoarding for 15, 20 years and it's taken a long time for them to get to treatment, but they can get significantly better. Uh, the, it's quite important for the therapist to do a, at least a few of the sessions at home and to ask the person to discard something and ask about the associated emotions and kind of see, see I mean, how the, the, the thought processes are because the therapy will have to be geared uh, and, and kind of individualized to the patient. So again, things like mindfulness or, or emotional freedom techniques or even um, professional organizers, everything can help as long as the patient you know, wants to engage in it. So not just the, the standard CBT. Uh, No, the, the, all, all the evidence is, is got to do with the CBT uh, and, uh, and the, other, um, the other techniques, there is more anecdotal evidence, uh, but of course no, no, I mean, no, no clinical trials. And again, some of these techniques may be helpful in some particular cases because we're talking about hoarding disorder, but no, no two patients with hoarding disorder will be the same, so you'll have to... Um, select a technique that is perhaps more geared to that particular patient. So this is quite interesting and it, uh, it's actually a very helpful uh, slide describing um, although it's dated 1996, so Frost is one of the main researchers on the field um, um, w when I met with him in, in, in one conference in just, just shortly after we had published our results he kind of told me, I mean we always thought that that hoarding was a symptom of OCD, but we just didn't believe it, but we, we were just never able to somehow prove it. So we just, um, I mean, he, he did a lot of research in hoarding and none on, on OCD. So he actually thought hoarding was a separate condition, but he just couldn't ever prove it. So, uh, but essentially the, the way in which he studied hoarding is quite comprehensive. Uh, hoarders will normally have distorted beliefs about possessions, uh, not so different from the ones we all have. So for example, feeling responsible about, you know, say an old piece of furniture that you may feel, oh, it's, it's quite worn out, I'm just going to check it, I'm just going to throw it to the bin or get rid of it. They may feel, oh, you know, this, this needs to have a future. This needs to be either recycled or given to somebody who's going to use it. So they, they, f they see that objects have a soul in a way, which we all do for certain things. I mean, some things that we think are useful normally we wouldn't feel like throwing them away, we'd feel like giving them to somebody, just a normal human feeling. But they'll have that even for very unuseful uh, items. Um, they feel extremely attached to possessions, particularly emotionally attached, even to things that, um, you know, like, a, like an empty plastic container, they could feel emotionally attached to it because they've been eating food there um, on a special day and they just feel that if they get rid of it, they're getting rid of memories. So. The, there's a lot of psychological um, processes going on. And, and then we know that there's probably a few neuropsychological uh, deficits like indecisiveness, the ADHD uh, type of symptoms, um, huge procrastination. They tend to be huge procrastinators um, and an element of dis disorganization. So all these factors will 
cause significant distress when they have to discard something. So they essentially avoid discarding it, which means you know their environments become cluttered. So that's kind of, in a very simplistic way, the CBT formulation for for hoarding disorder. Um, and now, have you heard of diogenes syndrome at all? Does, uh, has, has anybody ever heard the term at all? I thought it was the same thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it is sometimes used as an equivalent, and particularly in other countries, maybe not so much in the UK, diogenes syndrome. So, some, particularly the media sometimes will say, oh, elderly person with diogenes syndrome uh, was found dead at home, and then 20 tons of rubbish were taken off the flat. So I just thought it was it would be helpful to say what's what's Diogenes syndrome. So let's start with with Diogenes. Diogenes was a Greek man. He was, he was a philosopher, um, and he actually lived in a barrel. He wasn't a hoarder himself at all. He was a minimalist, and his he, you know his philosophy was that you don't need anything to be happy. Um, so Alexander the Great, who had heard of his his, his reputation, he just came uh, seeking wisdom, and he he actually offered Diogenes, you know anything he would need. He said, you don't need to live in a barrel, I'll, I'll give you anything you want, you know, come, come to me. So Diogenes' response was, well, well I, all I want from you is just to move aside because you're blocking the sun. That's all, he, that's all he needed. So it's the refusal of help uh, that, uh, that prompted Clark, who is the person who coined this term, um, to, to decide that there was something called Diogenes syndrome. It tends to be elderly people who live alone who are very ill, uh, but they refuse help. And they live in very squalid environments. And, and it's actually a, a relatively common presentation. We don't use the word diogenes because it's not accepted by classifications. We tend to use more like person living in self-neglect and squalid conditions. But if you do all that, uh, I mean, if you see elderly people or like the court of protection is filled with people who have serious health problems and they just refuse any medical help to the point where actually we have to do a mental capacity assessment and see whether we can enforce medical treatment upon them. So the, the, the features are generally self-neglect, their environment are, and appearance are extremely filthy, but they are completely oblivious to that. Uh, there's very little research, but we think they may be unable to perceive the smells and completely unable to perceive the, the squalid conditions that they live in. Um, the homes tend to be really squalid and they don't tend to hoard. It's just that, you know, when you live in squalor, it looks like clutter, but it's just, it, it is different. It is quite different. They're not too worried about not discarding things because they're attached to them. It's just they can't be bothered. They'll just leave everything as it is because they, they're not interested in, in cleanliness. So you'd think that all of them would have generally like a psychosis or some sort of mental condition, but amazingly, more than half of them are theoretically sane. They don't have any psychiatric conditions. So um, we, I, I personally tried to um, add Diogenes as a specifier on the DSM-5, but the, the research wasn't there yet. So it, it just didn't happen, maybe in DSM-6. But I truly think it's a separate entity that should be researched, but it's incredibly difficult to get the samples. Um, so we see it in the clinic relatively often, actually, but there, there, there's very little research on it. Um, now you'll very, I mean, I hear this very often. And um, just a slight seg segue, when, when I started working as a psychiatrist in A&E, uh, one of the things that my, my supervisors told me is, whenever somebody tells you, doctor, I'm not crazy, be worried, because that person's probably psychotic. Yeah. Um, whenever somebody tells you, doctor, am I crazy, you can be relaxed, that's probably an erotic. And it tends to work most of the times. So when somebody tells you I'm not a holder, that person is probably a holder. Because that means that they've been they've been named as hoarders. Very few people will call collectors hoarders because, like, if you if you see this, would you think this is a hoarder? Well, pro probably not. I mean, all the labels are nicely facing out. This is all really nicely organised. And so, who would think this is a hoarder? I mean, it's, this is like an obvious picture. Of course, it can be a little bit more tricky. Is this a hoarder or is this a collector? So, who thinks it, this is a a, a collector? Yeah, most of you. But maybe there's a collection disorder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we use the word disorder only if it's impairing. Of course, if the, if the collector will, you know, remortgage their house to buy items and, you know, not have money to feed their family and become so obsessed with the collection that, 
you could argue that, that this is, you know, in the context of ASD or autism, that can happen actually in the context of some problems. But generally, collecting is just a, a variety of human behavior. Um, so this is probably a collector. And, uh, and the reason is that all the bears are facing the camera. I know it seems, it seems silly, but there's th this has been prepared, right? This is not this is not random. Like a hoarder would just have, if she was a hoarder, everything would just be lying about, just scattered through the room. Same number of items, um, but this is very deliberately, uh, you know, placed. You know, in a, in a, and, and the items are very similar to one another. You know, she collects plates and, and bears and stuff. Of course, she doesn't have enough space, and it could be nicely organized in shelves. Some of it is, but she's using the space in the best possible way. It's slightly cluttered, but it, it is a collector. Can I be controversial? Of course, yeah. Because it's, it's, it's really hard. It's like a case so maybe she's a collector, but is there not room for suggesting that there might be, Absolutely, and it could be for me as well, but that's that's why all the psychiatric classifications outlining all the diagnostic criteria are very clear that if there is no distress and or functional impairment, there's no condition. That's because the variety of human experience and behavior is huge. You have people who do very wacky and strange things. <laughs> if they don't experience distress, if they don't harm other people, if they're not if their lives are not impaired, if they're able to function socially, personally, relationships, professionally, that's fine. We wouldn't call it a pathology. So if if this woman's house, I mean, if the, if the other rooms are reasonably uncluttered, if she's able to cook, uh, invite people home, um, go to work and just do the, the usual things and she doesn't experience a significant degree of distress, you could argue that she's a, a strange human being with very strange behavior and very obsessed. But it, but it's, your, it's her entitlement to be obsessed with her hobby, like there's so many men obsessed with football. Do you know, I mean, like, it's, um, would you call that, I mean, I think that's probably more pathological. That seems to be linked to Disney and... Oh, definitely, I mean, it's and you could... Figure, which is an association with childhood. Most definitely. So as a therapist, I'm, I'm really curious oh, about Oh, if you're looking at, of course, if you're looking from the third, I mean, bearing in mind, my, my heart is the heart of a psychiatrist, so our threshold is much higher, but as a therapist, if I was a therapist and I was seeing this person, I try to find out if there's an underlying meaning and if I can optimize her well-being by looking at attachment issues and why, why, why she does all that and try to see if there's, if there's a symbolism there that can help me, of course. Um, but as a psychiatrist, I wouldn't label, I wouldn't use any labels because I think it would be inappropriate. Of course, I'd have to look at the bigger picture, but yeah, this exercise is a very particular one. It's just about, is, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with this woman. Maybe there is, <laughs> but, it, but certainly I wouldn't use the label holding disorder. I would, I would use possibly other labels, but yeah. It, I mean, it's quite important to be non, um, I mean, to, to use labels accordingly, because again, you know, psychiatrists have been criticized, and probably rightly so, for overusing labels. Um, again, you know, the difference is, is quite significant. This, when you see it, I mean, there's no doubt, uh, things are just, completely piled up as they came, you know. Uh, this, this is a typical room of somebody with probably hoarding disorder. Um, so again, on hoarding and collection, actually we did a study where we interviewed lots of collectors, lots of holders, and we thought we were going to find more, more of an overlap, but we didn't. So um, about, f about one third of the population have some sort of collectionism type of inclinations, which is quite a lot. Uh, but very, very few people, I mean, about just about 2% of the general population will qualify for a diagnosis of hoarding, which I think is actually quite high, but the, the studies tend to replicate that extremely high prevalence. So only a, a small proportion of them seem to be so blurred that you don't know whether it's collection or hoarding. So it's a really small proportion that you could call extreme collectors, which probably have hoarding disorder and are collectors as well. Yes? Is that when you collect, you actually want to add something. Whereas yeah. with a hoarder, it's just 
you don't want to get rid of stuff. Absolutely. But I, as a, I have a little bit of hoarding, you know, here in me, and, and it's all to do with not wanting to waste. Not, I would not want to do planet by waste, but also, you know, this may have a, a use. I may be able to yeah. wear these jeans. Responsibility about the object. Yeah, so not wanting to throw away if you can reuse it. So yeah. it's kind of a, it's maybe super responsible, but it leads to yeah. butter. It's a, it's a very common trait and we all have that, it's just the threshold is different. Like if we, for example, we all tend to feel that if we have something that's very valuable but we're not going to use it anymore, for example a cradle for a baby or, or I mean if we think it's in mint condition, very few people will just throw it away. We'll probably keep it as long as necessary and find somebody who can use it. Uh, but if that happens uh, with just a plastic bag or with something that you feel is completely unusable and the person feels, oh no, I cannot get rid of it, you know, it should have a destiny, then of course you're entering into more tricky territory because it's not sustainable with a normal life, you know, to, to have to uh, look after the fate of every item that comes in your hands, which, which can happen to some people with hoarding problems. So it's about the intensity, not the actual uh, symptoms. Um, links with hoarding and buying. So um, most people with hoarding will engage in excessive acquisition and they tend to go to charity shops and just with a few quid gather as much as they can and they feel quite happy and do, and do that. And it feels a bit like an addiction. But that is different from compulsive buying. So uh, most people with compulsive buying have no hoarding tendencies. They'll just either use the items or give them away or just keep them and at some point, you know, do something with them. Um, so if you treat compulsive buyers, I'm sure you have come across very few orders. They just, they're more on the impulsive kind of spectrum. Um, so it's, I mean, although they seem similar, um, it's quite important to, to not lump hoarders and, and compulsive buyers because it's, it's a quite different type of psychopathology. Now, how does this look? It probably looks like the flat, or it could be an alcoholic. Right? I mean, it doesn't look like the flat of a hoarder, although it could be, but first thing that would come to mind is this is probably somebody with addiction or somebody with maybe with dementia or, 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 or somebody who is or maybe a serious, like severe psychosis mm -hmm. who is not uh, at all careful about their environment. They just eat and drink and they just dispose of things as they come. Um, but you wouldn't think of, of hoarding because things are not piled up. Um, it's all, it's most of it waste, it's also particularly squalid and, and dirty. Um, so if you ever see that sort of environment, you'd be thinking more about diogenes or squalid uh, type of presentation. So um, alcoholism and hoarding, is there a relationship? Um, probably not, because those uh, with, with significant alcohol dependence uh, they can have cluttered environments, but it tends to be, again, because of failure to maintain a level of cleanliness and not because they have any issues discarding uh, things. So they don't meet the criteria for hoarding. Even if you look at their, um, at their rooms and they may seem very cluttered sometimes, it's more along the lines of just self-neglect, literally, or the neglect of the environment. So again, just with a picture, you can get an idea, but you always need to see uh, the person behind the picture. Um, just a tiny comment on animal hoarding, which we see very seldom, uh, but of course much more often in, in, a, in rural areas. Just a one minute video. It's dinner time in Nina Koshtova's home, but there's no time to set the table or even get the plates out. This is the easiest way to feed 130 cats. I feel sorry for one, then another comes along, then a third, and on it goes. But it's not like collecting stamps, as some people suggest. You don't need to look after them for years. These cats are really hard work. Nina rescued her first stray 15 years ago, and with temperatures falling to minus 40 degrees Celsius in her hometown in Siberia, there are plenty of strays in need of shelter. So, one is named. I mean, this is kind of a relatively endearing case of animal holding, but. Uh, they, they tend to be very, very dramatic and very sad. So, um, when do you call somebody an animal hoarder? I mean, if, if somebody has seven dogs, would you say they're an animal hoarder? 20 dogs? 50 dogs? You, you don't know. If the dogs are properly looked after, 
amazing. They could, the person could be a dog breeder or, or a farmer with, with, with animals or somebody who's got a lot of money and a lot of space and, and a lot of pets. Of course, that person would be a little bit peculiar if they have 50 dogs, but you wouldn't call them an animal hoarder. So the criterion is not the number of animals, it's the conditions in which the animals are living. That, that is, again, the, the, the main uh, factor. So, of course, you need to have a large number of animals, but you need to not be able to look after them. And even worse, not be aware of the fact that animals are deteriorating, they're dying, they're ill, and, but you think you have a responsibility towards the animals, and you keep collecting animals and letting them breed, and you feel responsible for them, you think they're going to be better off with you than with any, anybody else. And people are really convinced of that. And even if the animals die, they seem to be quite, the animal holder tends to be quite oblivious to that fact. And it's, again, it looks delusional, but the, the cases of animal holding tend to all be in terms of sentimental attachment to the animals and thinking that the animals need to be with them because they're going to look after them better than anybody else. So that's the definition of animal holding. Um, this slide is just to signify that uh, hoarding seems to be a very preserved human behavior. Very, uh, I mean, if we think just a few thousand years ago, hoarding was actually a survival mechanism, particularly hoarding of food, but also hoarding of um, things that could help us with shelter, uh, with, with, you know, with, with clothes and stuff. So in the past, before the, the kind of consumer era, Hoarding was actually a very adaptive uh, behavior, and it's very well preserved in, in the animal kingdom. Yes? Can I just remind you of the time? Yeah, I sure. Have, um, maybe five more I've only got this final slide. Oh, great. This is the last one, yeah, so it's, uh, oh, wow, beyond, mm -hmm. beyond time. Um, so just very quickly, a little bit of practical advice. Um, when you have somebody with hoarding, um, you first of all want to make sure that they, they, they really have a diagnosis and they're not just, you know, collectors or somebody who hoards but doesn't meet the criteria. Uh, if they have impairment and distress, then, then you're probably looking at somebody with hoarding. The next thing you want to do is assess risk because people can, particularly elderly people, can fall. Uh, the risk of fires is huge and actually fire hazard is the main risk, but also infestation. Uh, there's quite a few risks that it, it's actually good to assess them because, you know, there's quite quite a lot of cases that come to the press because of uh, people dying or... Um, so the next thing is to try and be non-judgmental because just like people with BDD, they'll be really, really worried about... I mean, some people with hoarding, I've found... I, I've seen people who haven't been able to invite anybody home, even workers, you know, to, to carry out normal work for over 10 years because they just feel so embarrassed. And I am the first person who's entered their homes um, they feel extremely judged by everybody, so you need to be really non-judgmental, but of course this applies to everything in mental health. Um, understand the resistance to change. They want, they will not want to change, so if you start being a little bit too pushy, they'll just shy away. So you need to be really relaxed and find out if you can find a compromise. If the, if the holding is not very severe, uh, you may be able to either help yourself or find somebody who helps with the cluttering. Um, if you focus on a very a on, a, on a small area, for example, the kitchen or the bedroom, the bed, um, you want to focus on an area where a little bit of decluttering will have a big functional positive outcome in terms of them being able to reuse a part of the house that they weren't able to use. And that could be a good start. Um, and actually, that, even if you don't have massive experience, if the person's happy working with you and they trust you, it's not a bad idea if the case, if the holding uh, is not very severe. Of course, if the, if the person has very severe hoarding, then it's best to try and engage. Uh, I mean, a psychiatrist would be helpful in terms of the diagnosis, but probably they wouldn't have much experience. So I'd suggest that a CBT therapist would be uh, the person to go. Ideally, somebody with experience. If they don't have experience, they can just buy the, the CBT kind of model book, and if somebody has CBT experience, all they need to do is they read the manual and you know they'll get acquainted with how to treat hoarding. It's not terribly complicated. and. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.